G'day. Now for all you low speed aerodynamics consultants working at the interface between weight shift and three axis controls, this is how we worked out the pilot induced oscillation and lockout index. Which was first published in the May 2000 Pacific Flyer magazine published in Melbourne, Australia. But let's backtrack a bit because publication was pretty much the end of the story which began in 1992. Five months after I'd made a mess of the VJ24W Sunfun Budgerigar, that's me son there, when the bloke who'd originally begun building the VJ24 Sunfun but got sidetracked into playing with trikes which is why the project had taken 11 years between commencement and when he sold it to me when it looked like this. Of course another reason that he was slow at building the Jensen is because he'd taken on this project a carbon dragon designed by Jim Morpin a 43 foot span ultralight sailplane which took him five years to build which isn't surprising when you have a look at the work involved a lot in it endless hours with one thirty second of an inch aircraft grade 3 ply called the Carbon Dragon because there's quite a lot of carbon fibre in it including take these flap ribs where there's a quarter inch by quarter inch square section piece of spruce with a one eighth of an inch groove routed into it and then that groove has been filled with carbon fibre string pulled tight between two nails and the resin goes into the groove around it after the resin sets then you can cut it up to length and the carbon fibre is the strength and the wood gives you something to work with a lot of work went into that ultralight sailplane so while I was working on turning this into this old mate was busy learning to fly three axis in a tug which had been designed and built by a bloke called Bob Bailey working under contract for a fella called Bill Moyes because by 1992 hang glider pilots were getting too old to jump off cliffs and they had to be towed into the sky so when it was a hundred years old this came to Glen Innes and the intention was to use it to tow up the carbon dragon here's the dragonfly landing in the paddock in Red Range where I crashed and broke my foot and wrecked the Jensen. He's here coming to my son's birthday party. Now they say that if you fall off a horse you should get back on. So five months after I broke the Jensen, I got stuck on the luggage rack of the tug and used as a backseat autopilot to fly it to Inverell and back. And the idea there was to get me to watch while old mate in his dragonfly towed a friend in a regalo. And he said to me, listen, I'm going to give you a walkie-talkie and I want you to stand on the ground behind us and if you see the hang glider looking as if he's about to lose control, I want you to tell me to drop the rope before he turns upside down and ploughs into the runway. Can you do that, please? Now, these two characters had both had a bit of practice. The bloke in the tug had flown a hang glider behind a tug the bloke on the glider had been towing by somebody else who knew how to tow but uh, they were now back on their home turf and they were going to teach each other how to keep going and my job was the safety officer, aero tow launch controller. You can see the tow pole and the tow rope tied in a bundle. The pole sticks up on top of the rudder and the release is down on the tail wheel. So you've got a bridle running from the tow pole to the release and that means that the weight of the glider is being pulled through the thrust line at the centre of the propeller so you get no trim change when you release the glider. On the 7th of March 1993 we flew out 
to Waterloo Ag Strip and met a bloke from Inverell with his hang glider and did a bit of aero towing. Also did some air to air camera work. And in May 1993, we went up to Inglewood and uh, basically old mate was playing with his carbon dragon being towed up by the dragonfly at Inglewood and I got to run around hooking hang gliders up and watching the system and learning what worked and what didn't work. Now the system I saw in use at Inglewood in 1993 was that whoever was walking slowly past the hook up point could be expected to be asked to hook the glider onto the tow rope and if they understood the way the rigging was supposed to run well that was good. Then the glider pilot told whoever hooked him up that he was ready to take off. That person made a hand signal to the tow pilot who saw it in the rear vision mirror mounted beside the instrument panel and as they took off the tow pilot had been basically dividing his eyeballs between the instruments, the horizon and the rear vision mirror and uh, if the tow pilot thought that the glider was in trouble he was supposed to drop the rope. Well, I, uh, I was involved in the system for two or three days but when we came back home we decided we were going to keep going with the radios. It seemed like a better idea. Just as Otto Lilienthal couldn't swing enough weight far enough, nor could anybody else hanging from parallel bars, the hang glider pilot has a bridle which attaches not only to his harness but also to the keel up where the A-frame joins it. So you get an exercise in physics which means the force of the tow is pulling the pilot as much as it's pulling the glider and if he gets more than 45 degrees of roll facing away from the tow rope it's not actually possible for him to shift enough weight far enough to regain control which will cause the glider to roll inverted before it pitches enough to put enough stress on the weak links at both ends of the tow rope and thus releasing it from the tug. Now that's fine if you're high up in the sky and you can do a reverse Immelman in your hang glider but if you're down close to the ground it's a pretty dangerous option. So in March 1994 when we went to Englewood we found that Having an aero tow launch controller and safety officer with a radio who knew what he was doing, who could actually inspect the gliders, inspect the ropes and running rig, and then speak to the tow pilot and be in control of the launch for the first 500 feet, that made us pretty popular. Using the horizon and the wings of the tug as a reference, if the pilot is making the correct correction and he's got less than 40 degrees of bank on, you leave him alone. He's learning. If the glider sweeps across the centre line and the pilot's not making any control response, that means that they're behind the learning curve but they're not actually in danger yet. So you shut up. If the bank angle exceeds 45 degrees and it's increasing, the pilot's already putting maximum correction in and having no effect. That's when you call release, release, release. So we found. Inglewood is a large fly-in that happens at a small town in inland Queensland. It happens the weekend after Anzac Day every year and these photos at Inglewood were taken by my son who was five and a half years old at the time. The deal was he got three rolls of film for a three-day air show or fly-in. I was going to be busy with the hang gliders. If he fired off all 24 shots and he had nothing else to do for the rest of the day. Not too bad for a five-year-old. Photographing the action. A drifters demonstrating mustering technique in all attitudes. He also photographed the other tug on the field flown by a bloke called Clive. He would have made a good little industrial espionage agent. Here's his shot of Frank's tug, by comparison. 
And you can see he was more interested in the aeroplane than the face on the bloke standing next to it. I don't know who the fella was. You got a pretty fair shot of me wearing my old flying jacket working around the field. We used to charge $10 to pull them over the fence and up to a thousand feet. One dollar per hundred feet thereafter. Here we have a photo montage by a five and a half year old using an Agfa 110 camera. Not bad, eh? These are my shots of the same mustering. Demonstration by a drifter flown by an old friend. The first time you see him do this, you think, good God. The second time, you think, wow, he's still alive. The third time, you figure, well, he must know what he's doing and he likes doing it anyway. These are all taken from the ground. With a five power telephoto lens on a Russian built Zenit photo sniper. So, I'd seen this fella two years. He seemed to know what he was on about. So of course, I let my son go for a fly with him when he said he wanted to. So here we have Matthew at five and a half adding a drifter into his logbook. And yes, he has got a logbook too. See the little tiny head in the back cockpit. He's been known to go flying in the tug as well. Where you see him sitting in the back seat. And here we have him sitting in the back seat of the tug with his camera up to his face. Right? And this is the resulting picture taken by a five and a half year old. You've got the pilot's face in the rear vision towing mirror and you've got the flight line at Inglewood and he's managed to get the whole thing in focus properly lit, no drama and he didn't drop the camera and it Everything went fine. And this one's possibly the most remarkable picture of all. See the tracks going to the little olive green vegetation patch with a bright green vegetation patch in the middle of it. I said, what's that? There was a drought on. He said, dope crop, daddy. So anyway, in 1994, we thought it was all fun and games. And we were especially pleased when we were invited to... Uh, High Adventure Air Park at Port Macquarie as a tow team to help at a demonstration day for the latest greatest hang glider. Trouble is it was windy, there was mechanical turbulence from a sea breeze busted up by the trees and for once we'd managed to leave our radio gear at home so we were back to waving hand signals in the first place. So when the bloke who was rated neophyte strapped himself into a kite that was rated advanced and tried to fly in turbulent thermals he could have hooked up behind my mate's tug happily luckily that didn't happen he hooked up behind bill moyes instead the bloke who liked to put all his faith in towing mirrors and said you didn't need to have a radio so i watched when the neophyte came off the trolley and diverged and overcorrected as it photographed itself in my mind. As it just got worse by this point, I was already shouting that he was hopeless, he was gonna crash, and by this point, I was running up the runway. He got himself wings vertical, and he crashed. And it looked pretty much like this, as his wingtip hit the ground, and he cartwheeled under tow. I had identified myself as a general nurse to the ambulance, so we tried to resuscitate him. And he lived for three days, which made us just about the world experts in aero towing safety. When I couldn't get anybody in the industry to pay attention, I sent my results of 500 aero tows to the Civil Aviation Safety Authority and the lockout index, and a ground-based launch controller with radio was made mandatory industry standard in 1997 in Australia. And in May 2000, it was published in Pacific Flyer magazine. So I'm not as silly as I look. <laughs>